morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's a lovely day in paradise. Bit of high cloud, bit of blue sky. Temperatures back up in the uh, in the positives. So all is well. Let's get the let's try and get the exposure correct. Lovely. So how's it going? Have you had a nice uh, couple of weeks? We had to close the surgery on Thursday and Friday because of the snow. So uh, it's Tuesday today, so we've got a very busy day today. We uh, rebooked everybody. <clears throat> and uh, probably the busiest day we're going to ever have is today. And um, by busy, I mean, you know, I worked in the health service for a long time, so I know there'll be some people laughing and saying, yeah, 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 what, what do you call busy? With two checkups an hour, I call busy, yeah? So, you know, and if you've worked on the health service, you'll know that you can cope with, you know, you can do a family of four, a checkup in 15 minutes, no trouble at all. In fact, I'm getting to the point with my practice where uh, I am, I'm struggling, because we're charging 58 pounds for a checkup, and I'm struggling to, uh, you know, to do enough to justify that because no people have got no disease, they've got no uh, decay. They've got no, uh, very little or no gum disease now, most of them. And so, uh, you know, I'm having to resort to, well, we always do our uh, full mouth uh, disclose and full mouth camera pictures and oral hygiene instructions and that, and then, uh, Full perio chart. I mean, that's that's the next thing, isn't it? And then, what do you do if someone's got almost no plaque or and has had a perio chart? You know, just have a chat with them and then charge them 58 quid. And then you get very close to this situation where, which I've heard, you know, from from other patients talking talking about other dentists, where uh, they say, you know, I was only in there like five or six minutes and they, and they charged me 50 quid. And uh, you can see their point, can't you? I mean, it's difficult. Teeth are expensive. They're expensive to uh, possess and expensive to maintain. And uh, it's people don't put it in the context of it being about ten pounds a month. Um, and yet they'll quite happily spend ten pounds a month on getting their hair cut. Uh, but it's because it comes in a lump, doesn't it? It's better to perhaps spread it out a bit. Anyway, uh, I wanted to talk uh, about patients that you don't particularly like today. Uh, yeah, I know it's an odd subject, but there's a, there's a ton of odd subjects in dentistry that are never covered by the mainstream dental press. And uh, a disagreeable patients are, is is one of them. And I don't mean I don't mean um, disagreeable patients from the point of view of uh, you know, the difficult patient, how do you deal with the nervous patient, the phobic patient, uh, the smelly patient, you know, the, 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 the problem patient. I mean, just patients who, where there's some sort of cognitive dissonance between you and them, or where, uh, let me give you a good example. I had a, had a guy, came in recently, uh, and uh, he retired. Pleasant guy, a bit, a bit difficult because um, he he's, he's very much one of these like he visits to one dentist for every time he wants to have something done he goes to see a different dentist to get that thing done and then that's it you know so he very much sort of dips his toe in and out of the dental bathtub and so there's no continuity of care there because he, he's always unhappy with he, he never wants to go and see any dentist twice and the reason for that is he's on a campaign to have all his teeth extracted and he's decided that that for him that's the best thing would be to have all his teeth extracted and a set of false teeth he's got this attitude to his teeth that I've got to my hair which is that it's a bloody nuisance uh, and if I could stop it growing and save m money on haircuts I would but I can't so so really every time I go and see a barber I resent going <laughs> because He's taking advantage of the fact that I can't stop my hair growing. 
And this guy's uh, the same, he's got the same attitude with his teeth, you know, he's, his teeth are expensive and uh, constantly causing him problems and he sees the dentist as benefiting from that, the fact that he was just born unlucky, you know, and got an unlucky set of teeth. So what he's done is he's decided that he'd rather have all his teeth out. Now, what I say to the patients who tell me that, you know, and it's not, it's not common, but it's not unheard of point of view, is that, um, uh, you know, whatever problems you've got with your teeth, uh, pale into insignificance alongside the problems that you would have if you wore full dentures. And, uh, you know, other phrases like, uh, uh, dentures are not a substitute uh, for teeth, they're just the next best thing to having no teeth uh, come to mind. But uh, he was particularly entrenched in his view, which had been formed over very many years, probably decades, and uh, you know, no dentist was going to, uh, or, no, or no, no 10 dentists or no 20 dentists were going to <laughs> change, change his opinion on that because, you know, it was he was, uh, it goes It goes straight to the heart, doesn't it, of autonomy, you know, the patient's autonomy. All you can do is give the patient solutions. You can tell the patient what you would do if it, uh, you were in their situation, but you can't tell what, the, you can't tell the patient what to do. And uh, he's, and so, you know, I think when you've been in the profession for a while, you sort of, you give up early, don't you? You don't try and uh, persist and, and pursue because, you, you look in his face and, and I could tell just by looking in his eyes that he was saying, yeah, okay, you're gonna have a try. You're gonna fail like every other dentist has failed. You're, you know, you're telling me the same thing. I didn't listen to them. And if you think I'm gonna listen to you, then you're sadly mistaken. But I do understand why you feel like you've got to have a go, you know? So. Oh. So, junction of death. So, so I sort of, uh, he had a, he got an infection on an upper left two, a root. Uh, and basically he's got a six to six, I mean, I mean he's got six teeth at the front, so he's got three to three, three to three, and a couple of eights on the left, yeah? And, and, and lower, upper left eight, lower left eight. And he wants to have them all out. And when he came in, he said to me, I said, what's the problem? He said, well, I've got three problems. I got this problem, this broken tooth at the front, and then he said, these teeth at the back are painful. I said, the teeth at the back are painful because they're overloaded. Because you're eating on, they're doing the work of every single molar, you know? You've lost 12 molars, you're down to two out of 12. So, no, they're overloaded, so no wonder they're playing up. Yeah, well, he said, uh, I think I'm gonna have them out. So I said, well, let's, I'm just gonna deal with the problem at the front here, because that was, that was quite obviously uh, infected upper left two root. Now he'd been uh, taking anti-malarials because he'd been to Africa but then he decided that uh, as far as he knew he hadn't got bitten so he decided to stop taking them when he got back. And at this point you've got to question his, his IQ to be quite honest. Uh, someone who you know only only takes the anti-malarials, goes out to Africa, decides while he's out there that there aren't many mosquitoes because he's only found one bite and, and in his words it didn't really, nothing much happened, you know, it didn't swell up much or anything when he was bitten uh, and as a result he decided that he uh, couldn't be bothered to take his anti-malarials. But then when uh, he got toothache, when he stopped taking his anti-malarials, his toothache started. So he figured that because the anti-malarials were uh, antibiotics, I think it's doxycycline, that this doxycycline might have a have a role in the treatment of dental infection. So he started taking his doxycycline again. So that he's doing the right thing, but you know, for the wrong reasons in a way. So he said to me, well, what shall I do? And I said, well, you know, you're doing, I said, you're doing what I'd recommend that you do anyway, which is finish your antibiotics for your malaria. And then come back and then when it's, they've knocked the infection back a bit and we'll take the root out, which we did. Anyway, the point was, I mean, I'm setting that as the background to the to the punchline, which is that this guy used to work for British Airways, uh, British Telecom, 
and that those of you who are old enough will remember that uh, the when British Telecom was denationalised, um, there was a worry that the private sector, in particular the Chinese, would 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 flood the market with a load of phones, which were uh, unsuitable for connection to the telephone system. By which the implication was that they would either draw too much power and set fire to the wires in the wall or send too much power back up and blow up all the exchanges and the sensitive dialing equipment. Now this was the this is the narrative but of course the there was a hidden narrative as with all way, with all monopolies which is that they really didn't want any competition for the BT telephones. So what they did was um, they came up with a system of a green circle or a red triangle and uh, oh, hang on, stand by. Yeah, see, busy, busy, busy. Patience ringing up. So anyway, this guy, this guy was in charge of, or well, he was, you know, something to do with the compliance department, and he decided which phones were um, connected to the system and which weren't. But the the uh, the hidden agenda was that, of course, uh, British Telecom, having manufactured and sourced all the phones, really didn't want to lose their uh, lucrative business. Uh, selling phones and so miraculously almost all of the phones that were okay to connect to the system were manufactured by British Telecom and miraculously almost all of the phones the, the private sector phones that were uh, uh, that applied for certification to be attached to the system didn't get it they got a red triangle so and it's amazing because you get, you know, you finally, I remember at the time as a child being so frustrated and I wasn't a child, but I mean, I was a young adult and I was frustrated because it was a monopoly uh, and basically it was a quasi-state monopoly uh, and still is. Um, uh, frustrating the the, uh, the free market's attempts to try and move telephony forwards, you know, and to give us more sort of... You know, it was one step on the way to the iPhone, the feature phone. You know, the phone that had a had a answer phone built in, or the one that would redial automatically, or uh, you know. And the British Telecom phones were always so rubbish and so overpriced. And the really exciting phones, the ones that had like a memory where you could have 50 numbers and you could just press one button and dial any of the numbers. That all those ones were. Um, and they were still sold, but they were sold as as not suitable to being put on the network. But, and this is here's the guy. It's one of the guys who's behind it. Here's one of the guys who's who's. You know, I've already said his IQ was questionable. His job was really just to stamp a red triangle on everything that didn't say British Telecom. So I said to him, you know, was that is that am I right? Are you one of the guys that was responsible for holding back the advance of telephones for about 30 years? He didn't say a word. Did not say a word. You know, because we're in a privileged position, aren't we? I mean, okay, this guy is I don't it's not that I don't like him. I never actually don't like people. I don't really I don't think people are evil or even nasty. I think they all can be stupid, I think they can be greedy. Uh, they can be malicious, they're spiteful, but they're not. I, but I wouldn't say that inherently people are bad. I think their life makes them that way, you know. I think they're taught to be that way, uh, and perhaps intrinsically selfish, you know, because it's a life is a is a competition for resources, whether it's food, shelter, women, men, whatever. But uh, we are uniquely privileged in that I would, at the time, I wanted to strangle the people that were in charge of this policy. And I've, you know, you go through phases of wanting to strangle them and then not, not necessarily wanting to strangle them, but you wanting to bring them to justice, as the Americans say, make them take some consequences for their, their actions. And then the third and least satisfying, but still immensely satisfying, uh, stage is is just to challenge them and say look I know who you fucking are I know you you know I know you I know what you did because I was affected by it and you think that you're anonymous and the state kept you anonymous and uh, in the same way as you know the people who've who've mucked up the NHS dental system for the most part have just moved on you know that's the there's no accountability and occasionally you can make someone accountable 
just by by putting putting a point of view to them that they've never heard or have only very very uh, rarely heard or or challenging their sort of paradigm their their view of life which is which has never been challenged before putting the putting the opposite view I'll never forget uh, I had a patient who was um, when when I was much younger uh, there was a dictator in uh, Uganda called Idi Amin and he had a purge basically of uh, the um, non-Ugandan they were called the Ugandan Asians because they were Ugandans of Asian origin and he decided he was going to sling them all out and uh, as many of them had British passports um, and decided to come to the UK so he became a bit of a sort of a bet noir in the UK because uh, he sent us a load of uh, Ugandan Asians which we weren't all that pleased to receive but in fact I think kick-started the sort of the corner shop movement where you know you they, they, they took over the shops and worked long and hard and um, you know for not much money and uh, and 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 were a step towards the Tesco Express you know the 24-hour grocery so it, it turned they turned out to be quite a, a boon but you know in the same way as you can say any buddy coming in from abroad is prepared to work for next to nothing is a boon I mean is, is a cheap plumber a cheap Polish plumber a boon you know is a cheap Romanian builder a boon uh, to the country you know there's, there's views on both sides of that I can understand that but I had this guy coming oh he was full of himself he always came with his girlfriend they always arrived like they were arriving at the ambassador's ball and uh, uh, they were they they know they didn't they weren't happy about injections they certainly didn't want x-rays they believed that um, uh, they didn't want uh, silver fillings they only wanted white fillings because uh, because they'd been told that uh, germs grow underneath silver fillings that their ger silver fillings are inherently germy and they've been told this by their good friend Dr Christian Barnard who carried out the first heart transplant uh, and therefore was an expert on dentistry for some reason and uh, they caused me no end of grief you know because they were going on about they you know they wanted all the silver fillings taken out and they wanted it done in a certain way and they've certain they've swallowed all this hook line and sinker you know this silver filling removal malarkey and uh, anyway I said to him you know what do you do and and he said oh I was in government in uh, Uganda so I said oh really that's interesting yeah and he said uh, yeah around about the time that uh, Idi Amin was in charge you know I'm like oh and I knew that I knew the Ugandan story very well and I think he'd it was a few years previously but I think he realized straight away that I was completely up to date with what had happened in Uganda at that point you know the extrajudicial uh, crimes that were committed and um, and here he was trying to re rehabilitate himself by saying and he said a phrase to me which I'll never forget he said yes very a very unfortunate very unfortunate times those you know greatly deeply regrettable very unfortunate and I'm like, oh really? Is that what you do? Is that how you? So what you do is you rape and you murder and you you do commit genocide and expel a bunch of people who've got a right to live in the country, and then ten years later, fifteen years later, you you go abroad where no you think nobody knows you, and you just say, oh, deeply regrettable. What a shame. You know, very regrettable. And um, and needless to say. He chose not to come back, I think, because I think he 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 understood that we knew what sort of person he was, and he was in he was in hiding. Effectively, he was in what call it moral hiding, but he was in effectively he was running from from any uh, body who knew what he'd done. But we didn't mind losing him because it was a bit of a pain in the do though. So anyway, I don't know, have you ever got any patients like that? What, what do you do with them? Do you do, I mean, I treat them, you know. I mean, they took this guy's tooth out. I was very polite to him and everything. Uh, there's no, there's no, but, you know, I don't, uh, I don't shy away from saying, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that, that was a pretty bad, that was a pretty bad time for me, you know. 
I don't say thanks to you, <laughs> but it's implied. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.